welcome back to the Chem OG. Today we're going to focus on a topic that's confusing for a lot of chemistry students, and that topic is the Gibbs free energy change. Now, when we talk about delta G and delta G naught, those concepts tend to be very, very quantitative, and there's a lot of equations that we can use in order to be able to calculate a whole bunch of different stuff. But as you know, we focus on fundamentals more than we focus on trying to memorize things. So I want you to understand the basic foundational concept behind what the Gibbs free energy change is trying to measure. And so the Gibbs free energy change is a measurement of how much energy there is available as a result of a reaction happening to be able to do work. And so if a reaction leads to uh, a decrease in the Gibbs free energy change, it means that the products are more favorable. So certainly if you uh, watched our stability and reactivity module, you're aware that lower energy means more stability. And so if our reaction leads to a lower Gibbs free energy than before, it means that that reaction is favorable and it's very um, likely that we will form products. And so the way that we indicate a decrease in free energy is to have a negative delta G. And so what are the factors that contribute to a lower delta G? Well, there's a bunch of things that we can measure, but primarily what we use to measure are the following. When we conduct our reaction, is that reaction going to release heat or is it going to absorb heat? If the reaction releases heat, that contributes to an energy give off. In other words, if our reaction released heat, that means it had it now possesses a lot less energy, a lot less thermal energy than it did before. And that actually helps to contribute to stability because, again, lower energy means higher stability. So a release of heat would be something that contributes to a lower value of delta G in the end after the reaction happens. Another thing that contributes to a lower delta G is taking a look at how spaced out your molecules are, how spaced out your particles are. And so we want our particles to have a good amount of space among them. That contributes to an overall stability in our system. And the way that we measure how far apart the molecules are is to take a look at entropy. So having increased entropy, in other words, having more space among the molecules, having more freedom of movement is actually a good thing. Now, most textbooks refer to entropy as disorder or chaos or randomness. Those are all very, very negatively connoted words. Instead, think of entropy as molecular freedom. Think about molecules having more space to move and that ability to be able to spread out, move around is actually a positive contributor to having a lower energy or higher stability overall. So people like to have their own personal space. Molecules like to have their own personal space as well, because remember that molecules are composed of electron clouds on the outside, and we don't want those electron clouds bumping into each other unnecessarily. So a release of heat and an increase in entropy are going to contribute to a, uh, a decrease in the free energy, and that contributes to the products becoming more favorable. And the equation that combines all of those terms is this one. So delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. And so the T term must be in Kelvin. So whenever we measure temperature in terms of equations, just to err on the side of caution, you always want to use the Kelvin scale. And to give you a little primer on the Kelvin scale, the Kelvin scale is constructed based on the Celsius scale. A change of one degree Celsius is actually, interestingly, equal to a change of one degree Kelvin. But the uh, difference between the Celsius scale and the Kelvin scale is in their starting positions. So the difference between the Celsius scale and the, and the Kelvin scale is about 273. So zero degrees Celsius is equal to 273 Kelvin or thereabouts. Uh, 25 degrees Celsius is 25 degrees above zero, which means that it's 25 degrees higher in Kelvin as well. So that's 298.15 Kelvin. So those two temperatures, 273 and 298, are ones that we use in uh, certain lab measurements all the time. And they're certainly ones with which you should be familiar. So let's talk about some possible values of delta G. And so we mentioned a little bit earlier that Having a negative delta G is desirable. It means that the system overall, in terms of the changes that are happening to it, is getting to a point of lower energy or higher stability. And so when we have a negative value for delta G, 
uh, we say that the reaction is spontaneous uh, because it's go moving in a favorable direction. So it's kind of doing it on its own. And the technical term for a negative value for delta G is exergonic. So the uh, prefix ex uh, a lot of times is going to indicate that something is exiting. And what's exiting here is energy, right? Energy is leaving. And so we call this an exergonic process. Uh, the delta G value, it can be positive, but that would indicate the opposite of everything that ne negative delta G would indicate. And so a positive delta G means that your reaction is not going to happen on its own. It's unfavorable happening on its own. And we say that it is endergonic instead. So EN uh, means that something is entering. And so there's an, an, you know, an overall influx of energy. Um, and that works against us because what that does is it decreases our stability. So exergonic and endergonic refer to delta G. And you're likely very familiar with the terms exothermic and, ex and endothermic. Uh, those would refer to delta H instead. But when we're talking about delta G, you want to make sure that you're talking about exergonic and endergonic. So a negative delta G means that we're favoring products. A positive delta G means that we are favoring reactants instead. Well, if we're not favoring products and we're not favoring reactants, that means that we're kind of happy where we are, right? Where products can form in one direction, reactants can form uh, in, in the opposite direction to the same degree. And remember that when your reaction's forward rate is equal to its reverse rate. In other words, you're forming products just as favorably as you are forming reactants. That's an indication that your reaction is at equilibrium. And so when the reaction has reached equilibrium and when you're not favoring reactants or products, then your delta G value is going to be zero. So at this point, we still haven't talked about delta G naught at all. So what is delta G naught? Well, the degree sign is used to indicate something called standard conditions. And sometimes that's also called standard state. So whether it's standard state or standard conditions, both of those things are synonymous with each other. Okay. You may have also heard of a situation known as STP. STP is not this. So STP has to do with gases. Uh, we, will deal, we will deal with that in a separate lesson. But here we're just talking about standard conditions. And standard conditions are spelled out in these three things. Standard conditions are a pressure of one ATM, or essentially what the pressure is uh, at sea level. Okay, and that's equivalent to 760 Tor, um, and it's also about 100,000 Pascals in terms of SI units. Temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, but remember, we're looking to measure things in Kelvin, so that's approximately 298 Kelvin. And possibly the most important uh, criterion for standard conditions is concentration. Um, and that concentration of everything, whether it's reactant side or product side, has to be one molar. So whatever concentrations of things you happen to be measuring, all of those concentrations have to be at one molar. So in order for us to measure delta G naught, all of those conditions have to be true. And so the condition, the equation, excuse me, that combines delta G and delta G naught is this one. So delta G equals delta G naught plus RT natural log of Q. Okay. Uh, sometimes LN is indicated as log base E. Those are those are equivalent to each other. And so, what is R and what is Q? Those are two variables that we necessarily that we haven't necessarily mentioned yet. And so, R is the universal gas constant. Depending on what units you use, that can take on several different values. Uh, so, for example, if we're using the ideal gas law, that value is really close to 0.082. Uh, if we're using um, another equation that uses joules for energy then uh, you know, you're looking at a value that's closer to 8.31. So the value of the universal gas constant is going to be situational depending on what units you're employing at that particular time. T is temperature and that has to be in Kelvin. Q is our reaction quotient. So the reaction quotient, as you can kind of tell from the name, so remember in terms of uh, our math terminology, the quotient is the result when we divide a number by a number. And so the reaction quotient is a ratio of products to reactants, okay? And that may seem familiar, right? Maybe be scratching your head and thinking, is not the equilibrium constant K? Well, K is only measured when we're at equilibrium, but Q can be measured at any point. So you can always take a ratio of your products to reactants and whatever your ratio of products to reactants happens to be at that particular point, um, that's gonna you know, factor into the delta G value that we find. 
And speaking of equilibrium, we just mentioned that word a moment ago when we were talking about the different values that delta G can take on. And so we can measure delta G at any point in our process. It doesn't necessarily need to be at equilibrium. So in fact, it's the reaction is not at equilibrium so long as delta G is a value other than zero. So anytime you have a positive delta G or negative delta G, that indicates that your reaction is totally not at equilibrium. Okay. So if that's the case then, right? If this is the equation that we that combines delta G and delta G naught, think about the following scenarios. What if we're at standard conditions? Well, remember standard conditions means that pressure is one ATM and our temperature is 298. But remember the other thing that we mentioned is all of our concentrations are gonna be at one molar. And so if all of our concentrations are at one molar, it means that all of the numbers that go into calculating Q, all of your product concentration, all of your reactant concentrations, all of those are gonna be one. And so Q is equal to one at standard conditions. And so if I plug in Q as a value of one into that equation that's up top, here's what I get. And I get a very, very nice result when I plug in one into a natural log. And that's because the natural log of one is equal to zero. And because the natural log of one is equal to zero, this whole term totally drops out. And that means that delta G is just plainly delta G naught, okay? So this shouldn't surprise you. And when I say this, I'm referring to the fact that delta G naught is the value of delta G when we measure the reaction at standard conditions, okay? Now, think about how often it is the reaction has reached equilibrium in which you don't prefer products and you don't refer reactants at 298 Kelvin and precisely at 1 ATM and when all of your concentrations are at 1 molar. Those are very unrealistic conditions for establishing equilibrium. And so your delta G naught, you want to think of it as a constant that's unique to that reaction. Okay, so whatever value we calculate based on a Q value of, of, of 1, um, and a temperature of 290 Kelvin and a pressure of 1 ATM, that was, that's going to measure the uh, direction of the reaction under those very special circumstances. Okay, and that's because delta G naught can only be measured under standard conditions. And so delta G naught kind of gives us a, a reference point, right? It's something that we can measure in the lab and force our conditions to be a certain way. And then we can determine, hey, the reaction is moving to products whenever we force these conditions, or the reaction is moving to reactants whenever we're forcing these conditions. So here's our master equation again. And I wanna take a look at a very particular circumstance. And that particular circumstance is what happens when the reaction has reached equilibrium. And so when the reaction has reached equilibrium, it means, as we saw from before, that our delta G value is zero. So delta G naught is a constant. It's not gonna change where we, you know, depending on where we are in, a, in the process, but we know that at equilibrium, delta G is going to be zero. And our ratio of products to reactants, which is Q, if we're making sure that we're at equilibrium, our Q value is actually going to be equal to K. And so if I substitute both of those special values into the equation up top, wherever I see delta G, I'm going to plug in zero. Wherever I see Q, I'm going to plug in K. Our expression now looks like this. All right. And if I clean up that expression by subtracting RT natural log K from both sides, here's what I'm going to get. I get that delta G naught is equal to negative RT natural log of K. And so let's take a look at different values of K and the consequences those values are going to have on the value of delta G naught. So let's start with the case that K is greater than one. And what that means is that when we've reached equilibrium, if K is bigger than one, it means that we have more products than we do reactants. And if we do have more products than we do reactants, it means that our overall value of delta G naught is gonna be negative. And that's because the natural log of a number bigger than one is gonna be positive. T is always gonna be a positive value because it's temperature measured in Kelvin. And R is a constant that's also positive in terms of quantity. And so if I have R and T and natural log of K all as positive values, then that means that delta G naught is going to be negative. 
And let's take a look at what happens when k is less than 1. Well, when k is less than 1, whenever you take the natural log of a uh, positive number that's less than 1, what you're going to get is a negative value. Okay. So when you take the natural log of a fraction less than 1, you're going to get a negative value. And that totally flips the sign on delta g naught. So what that means is that when the reaction has reached equilibrium, our ratio of products to reactants is less than 1. In other words, we have more reactants than we do products. And so that means that our delta dot g naught value is going to be positive. And in the very special circumstance that when the reaction reaches equilibrium, that your ratio is 1 to 1 in terms of products to reactants, it means that your delta g naught value is going to be equal to 0. Now, we talked about the differences between delta G and delta G naught. Uh, sometimes you see a delta G naught prime, and that prime just means that you're looking at a pH of 7. And so primarily you see that um, in biochem, uh, but certainly is not something that you encounter quite often. And so you would treat delta G naught prime just as you would delta G naught. It's a constant, and it's very, very specific to the reaction. Thank you for watching today's lesson. Don't forget to like and subscribe.